Okay, yeah, welcome everybody to the first armchair anthropologist that's back in person. We have Connie Smith here, Dr. Connie Smith. Uh, and so, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? What do you study here? How do you classify your research or what kind of stuff do you do? Oh, sure. Okay. So, yeah, I'm Connie Smith. Uh, I'm a social anthropologist, but I also am very interested in history and historical methods, and also I work for the art as well. So I'm a social anthropologist, but I'm also in this That's awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, so first to start off, like, why did you become an anthropologist and how did you end up uh, being an anthropologist? That's a good question. So I started off doing my undergraduate in history and actually I had no idea what a social anthropology was. So I'm always very impressed that undergrads choose to do anthropology because <laughs> I think when I was 18, I had never heard of it. Um, and then I quite liked doing an industry degree, but it wasn't, it, it didn't grab me. It was fine, but it didn't grab me. And then I went off and did some other things for a while. And um, one of those things was I ended up uh, being a graduate um, research assistant at the British Institute for Eastern Africa, which is in Nairobi in Kenya. And that was a really cool program that basically matched up uh, research graduates with academics who were working in the region. And so I spent six months there being an assistant to various people. So I did some archaeology, got a lot of time digging the hole, um, and did some archive research, and then also did some uh, ethnographic field work, assisting a couple of different academics. And that, through that, I thought, oh, this is great, I really enjoyed it. And from that, then, but I was also still into objects and history. So then I went and did a master's in museum anthropology. Um, and then I worked in museums for a couple of years, and then I did my PhD um, after that. That's really cool. Uh, I guess, what, what drew you to ethnography when you were, uh, like, what did you do that in that program? Yeah, so I suppose for me, what I didn't really like about history was that uh, I didn't get to talk to people. And so although oral history is a big thing, we didn't really do it much in my degree, and I realised that I got to actually so I was using the work that I really liked talking to people, and I really liked the experience of immersing myself in a place and really getting to know it. Um, and I think to start with, I didn't really realize it was what anthropology meant, and they grabbed me with my family and wanted to go see. It's probably a good way to spend your time. That's awesome. Um, so, much more specific question. So, you, you, you talked about that you've done that for a year, and I guess you kind of answered the question of it, but like, um, you, you tend to work in Nairobi and in a bunch of other like African cities. I, in, when I was looking into sort of like urban ecology in the last like 10 years, it's very big focus on uh, these like vast growing cities in the Google South. And so, what, what drives your interest in those places more generally than in Nairobi, where you have such a connection? And then, why do you think that's like such a big focus in urban ecology? Yeah, that is a really good question. So, I suppose historically, um, you know, anthropology. So it's not like so it's not as many things, but one thing was that basically like the rural pursuit. You know, I mean, you've probably never heard of rural anthropology. That's not a thing because it's just kind of the beginning of the discipline was about going to you know far flung remote places, um, and there was a kind of um, fetishization. That's basically the most remote, the most kind of wild ways into you could get. And so cities were too modern, too crowded, too full of. Uh, external influences and things like that. So, unfortunately, the discipline has moved on since those kinds of quite narrow minded approaches. Um, and so, urban anthropology has really boomed in about the last 20 years. Um, and you know, the world has changed, and the way we think about African research has changed. And so, I think, and because African cities are relatively new in the sense of like the scale that they reach, I guess that sparks a lot of interest. And the same too um, in Asian cities, although you don't know where quite a lot of them but I mean most of the urban growth of the world is in Asia and Africa at the moment. And I suppose like all subjects we like to be able to find my own things are changing. Um, so for me I think I'm really interested in how how cities change over time but also what happens to what was there before. So my interest in materiality and buildings and history is basically about 
So your cities get built on top of stuff that was there before, and that stuff can't help but influence what happens next. So I'm really interested in how you know, most of us will live in houses or buildings that are older than ourselves, possibly older than you know, our grandparents, whatever, and that we live with all of these domains of previous politics and ideas. Um, and I find that very interesting in particular in these kind of spaces because it has this very, has a very huge diversity of um, ethnic cultures and how those different ethnicities kind of come into the city space. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, I guess you, you said that you've, you've done ethnography both there and in London. And so I guess what, uh, how do you draw the two together or how do you employ the, the comparative method with those two examples? Yeah, so I'm just going to, this is one of my good stuff on the screen. So <laughs> she was someone who I interviewed in the first project of the library. She's called Eddie and that's amazing work. So I'm just going to flip through. So this is where I've been doing film at most recently, which is the Grenfell Tower fire, or looking at the aftermath of the Grenfell Tower fire in West London. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in, so I'm from London originally, um, so it was partly an experiment in what happens when you do the work in your own place and how that is both easier than some effect and also really challenging. I think, so for me, what sparked this project was um, thinking about the differences, the dramatic differences between London and Nairobi, but also some surprising kind of commonalities in the languages that people are using. So for example, um, London is famous in the housing crisis, so too in my room there's been a housing crisis going on for a long time. The cost of living is dropping. Um, there's a kind of huge migration of people from not just from around Africa but from around the world to become a very cosmopolitan, diverse city. But on the other hand, there are still these underlying tensions around the dividing lines in the city that actually have quite strong echoes. So Nairobi is a city that's built by British colonialism. There wasn't any kind of settlement there before. Um, so it has like these legacies of British urban planning and design that um, shape uh, how the how the neighborhoods are formed. And so this project, thinking about the Grenfell Tower fire, really happened because on the same day as the fire, which was June 14th, 2017. Um, the, the same day that that happened in the high rise block in London, there was um, a tower block in Nairobi in the neighborhood next to the place where one block feels like that and that collapsed. And so I was kind of watching these two very dramatic and um, tragic events as they happened and kind of following the debates online and things like that. And I was just really struck that a lot of the conversations that people were having on Twitter or in the press um, were really similar. Um, and so that's why I thought it'd be really interesting to think about like what could we learn about comparing the two of these two places that seem so different but actually have a lot of similarities. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, what kind of food did you conduct in London? Uh, so it's very much ongoing, but I'm going tomorrow to do a bit more. Um, but it is a mix of different things. So I've done a lot of artistic observation, generally spending time uh, in the area of different community organisations, um, I've done a lot of interviews, I've spent a lot of time with, um, uh, I guess in quite formal settings, a lot of community meetings, consultations, things like that. Um, so a lot of this work I did in 2020, which is not a great year for doing good work. Um, so it was very interrupted. Um, and so the kind of things I imagined I was going to do, which was a lot of community participation and um, workshops and getting kind of a lot of community involvement was very difficult for those who probably were not that. Um, so one thing I spent quite a lot of time doing was thinking about what kinds of places might still be active. And one thing that I spent a lot of time doing is uh, looking at food networks. So as you all aware, you know, during the, particularly at the start of lockdown, there was that kind of real Surge and people who wanted to volunteer and get involved, you know, at partly as a way of building accounts, partly as a way of supporting their communities. And food banks and other kinds of um, meal deliveries became a way that lots of people were involved in that. And that was a big thing in North Kensington, which is where Grandpa's house is. Um, 
And so I, what I was really struck by from that work is that a lot of the emergency volunteer networks and support systems and communications that came about after the fire basically got reactivated by COVID. And so people, so the, the local mosque, for example, was an amazing uh, resource and place of support after the fire. So they were immediately on the phone to the people that lived in the room before. Um, and so I was able to see these kinds of traces, if you like, of the fire in how the area was going to be And so that's the kind of how it I guess uh, use a different definition. So you, you you've written about sustainability in relation to like urban issues, and you you specifically in one paper, at least one paper, talked about um, aspirations and urban change and future urban development. Um, and the, the, those questions seem to be like they're inherently political. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if, if you see any kind of like political like aim or purpose to like the kind of uh, like ecology. Yeah, that, uh, yes, in that um, I think one of the great things that Anthony is really good for is just thinking outside the box, thinking critically about systems and policies and ways of doing things. And I suppose what I'm interested in doing is both doing that for myself and thinking about okay, what is it that I'm doing with. So I find sustainability very interesting because it's like almost an uncriticized term, right? It just sounds like a good thing. We all want to be sustainable. But what does that mean? What happens when you've got questions of social sustainability versus environmental sustainability? What does that even mean? What are you sustaining? Do we want to sustain All right, okay. Right. Okay, we carry on. Sustainability. Well, we about sustainability. Oh yeah, sustainability Sustain. sounds like good. it's just, of course it's a good thing. Um, so I suppose thinking about ways to look at what that means on the ground like what do people do when they talk about sustainability how do they put it into practice how do governments or councils um, introduce things to encourage sustainability and what do they mean by that and how do they implement it, it became something i was really interested in so yeah so that is a kind of form of political critique but i suppose the other aspect that i say more broadly that is political about my work is about um, participation and so trying to make it you know not just about my voice but about how to engage and involve different kinds of communities in the research and to do research that is useful and meaningful for them um, so i've done quite a lot uh, in the past with citizen science projects i don't know if people are familiar with citizen science so it comes from well, as it sounds like, I suppose so it comes from science uh, in, in its kind of roots. So you might have possibly even done things at school where like there's an annual day every year where everyone goes and like counts the birds that they see in their back garden and then you report them to the RSPB, RSPB or something like that. Or sometimes people have been involved with doing like water sampling or things like that. So in citizen social science, uh, it's more about collaborative research. And so what I try to do is work with different community groups to get them involved in the design of the research from the outset. And so of doing work that not only that I find interesting, but that is useful for them. So in the case of Grandfather, this is about looking at like forms of planning and investment and change that's happening in their neighborhoods and trying to get their voice into things to do with urban planning or um, raising, you know, finding ways to bring their questions to that they have into the fore. Um, and hopefully that is also, um, you know, they also get skills that are beneficial to them. And so people have, in the past, people have gone on to do other kinds of research projects. And so someone who I've been working with for quite a long time is having a master's in urban geography at UCL. So it's kind of like, hopefully some more like broadly political questions there as well. Awesome. That's great. That That's like all the questions that I had prepared, but is there anything you want to talk about from your slideshow before we go to question and answers? Uh, it's hard to see it because of the smart thing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's more this. It's not on camera. No, it is. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. It's, still there. Uh, it's just more this kind of constant flipping. Oh, yeah. So we might start with that. 
We could do something about that. Okay. Anyway, so is there any edit that you want to talk about or that you like, I mean, not like really. to talk about? to say, well, I did just, I didn't really select these with any kind of agenda, but right. just a few um, images, I guess, I've been working with recently. So this is about looking at kind of long-term histories of demolition and urban change in North Kensington. So that's kind of, it's the demolition of a brewery on the left in the 1930s, and then the demolition of so-called slum housing in the 1960s. And so that's what paved the way for Grenfell Tower and the related estate to be built. And so trying to put those kinds of events in this from your perspective of change. I think you're on a, it's a thankless task. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just keep flipping through. I don't know why it's not just going around. Is that the last one? Can you go the other so direction? So you have to click on the screen, I think. There you go. It's not, it's not very. <laughs> um, and then this is, I can, Different project. This is in Nairobi in a neighborhood where I did my PhD field work. Um, on the uh, bottom. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it's impossible. <laughs> so hopefully you can kind of see in the background there. So these are people who, um, who I, these three guys who are kind of driven by that um, information, um, I met during my PhD field work. And um, I was really struck by them because I came across them building this, what they call an extension, which is this corrugated iron building on the left, and they were attaching it to this old house. And so I got chatting and I asked them, you know, what are you doing? And um, I expected them to say, like, oh, we're building you know, a room or like somewhere to sleep. And they said, this, this is urban renewal. We're doing our own urban renewal. Okay. And so I kind of like love the fact that they adopted this language and they were carried on they said you know we've waited so long for the government to bring change to our neighborhood and nothing's happening so we're just going to do it ourselves and so even though what they're doing like looks very modest and it's quite um it's very ad hoc they don't have any training um they kind of situated what they were doing as part of this much bigger process and so for me that was like a kind of turning point <laughs> Um, in my project because I started to see that these are not separate things it's not like the government is doing this and people are doing this but that people have different agendas and different politics to what they're doing but they all see themselves as making Nairobi in this quite particular way uh, so that's the story of those that's really cool. uh, and there's also like when you are oh, you guys are getting onto dissertations now but like sometimes when you're doing field work you get sort of one quote from an interview and it's like <laughs> write it down really quick it's like the key quote but then you kind of hang everything on and for me that was one of those moments and so that became it's on like the pretty much the first page of my book um it became this kind of thing that was like very simple but made me think yeah. have you encountered that before like or I, since then like people talking using that kind of like state yeah. language for their own practices yeah definitely so one thing that also comes up so in in kenya there's this huge um government like nationwide initiative that they call vision 2030 which is this like a development agenda um to, to turn Nairobi into a middle class country by 2030 or something as the tagline uh which involves kind of huge urban development projects it's very much kind of looking at uh, a model of urbanization that looks like uh, Dubai or Shanghai or somewhere like that so that in itself is very contentious. But one of the things that was really fascinating was that um, these kind of small DIY projects that people are doing, loads of them, so there's a little bar around the corner from, um, from that place and the bar renamed itself Vision 2030. Uh, and then you go along like someone would have written Vision 2030 down the side of a bus. Um, and so I just love how people get invested. So that's, I guess you asked about aspiration. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Like they don't want their city necessarily to look like Shanghai or like Dubai, but they are invested in changing the future and thinking about their city. Oh, that's really different. Cool. And those weren't tongue in cheek? Well, sometimes they are. So there was also like a, um, a big, what do they call it? A digital transition initiative or something. Um, and so digital also became a word that people used a lot. But that would often be very sarcastic. So when something breaks down or the bus doesn't come, people would be like, 
this is digital. <laughs> Here we are in Nairobi where everything's digital, nothing works. So yeah, people do use it. Oh, that's, that's good. Yeah, so this is also from uh, Gunstar, as you can see. So on the right is an image from last summer. Um, so obviously that's coming from um, the Black Lives Matter um, sort of rallying cry of um, the words of George Floyd's murder, George Floyd's last words before he was murdered. Um, and that was projected onto the tower on the anniversary of the fire. And so you can see there like a really strong connection being drawn by campaigners between their experience and their um, sense of institutional racism and injustice in terms of how the background to the fire and drawing that connection then with um, the movement for Black Lives and um, you know, a kind of global uh, movement. And this, there's many ways that that comes out, but I mean, really strikingly in these words, which were on the night of the fire, these were literally the last words of lots of people who were trapped in their homes. And so this kind of incredibly basic thing of breath as something that we all do, it's essential to human life and how that can itself become political was something that I was really struck by. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Cool. Uh, there, yeah, there are any, any questions? And also from the Zoom too, right? Yeah. Well, if you want me to talk about any more pictures. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you meant you were done. Could you talk more about citizen social science? and the importance of this in research. I'd love to hear more specific about the work that's done with the grandmother and adding their social impact into research. Mm, that's a good question. So people would describe it in different ways. So like most methodologies, it is a flexible one. But I think for me, citizen social science is about trying to do research projects that, that remain, you know, academically rigorous um, and are kind of independent in that sense, but also which work for the neighbourhoods where they're based. Um, so what that means in practice is kind of hard to say because every time it's, it's different. But for example, we might start a project with a community workshop that says, you know, this is my idea, this are the things that I'm interested in. Does any of this resonate with you? What are the things that you're dealing with and how, you know, what resources are you lacking? So one of the things that's come up really strongly in North Kensington is a way to get local people's voices uh, heard. So there's unsurprisingly lots of criticism of how the city has been working and um, huge issues with, with government and mistrust of government as well. But there's not necessarily the, the channels that are open to for that voice to make a strong impact. So one of the things that people said they wanted was to develop an app where they could put their own, do you know, so in the UK, if someone wants to do any kind of building projects, they have to get a planning permission from the council. So this was one thing where they said, well, maybe we can get our voice into this planning process and so we've been talking about ways we can do that and how to make it less just about the technicalities and the, and the, the kind of um, very instrumental approach and more subjective. So more about like how a place is making you feel, where do you feel safe? What does unjust design look like? So how can we think about like what feminist urban design would look like? Or um, you know, how do we think about how race is embedded in urban space? Um, and so we were trying to come up with a way that their feelings and like also quite sensory responses could um, be recorded. Um, so it's still in the early stages, but we're basically developing plans to make an app um, so that you could literally go to a new space or to review a project and you'd, you'd fill in various things about what's going on while you're there. How does it make you feel? What are you concerned about? And then that would then channel into uh, like planning review and consultation. Process. So that's one example. That's really interesting. Do you have any more from the, do you want to open the chat? Oh yeah. Oh, about sound? <laughs> that's Abby. 
Any any questions for folks in the room? You mentioned uh, race and racism is embedded in architecture. Do you mind expanding on that? Okay. Yeah, so um, there's kind of different ways in which that happens. So you might look at, say, uh, I mean, the most obvious example would be cities in the States or in South Africa, where um, in South Africa, apartheid is a kind of racial segregation a system for racial segregation. So that is literally built into urban space in that there are white spaces and non-white spaces. And so your permission to move is curtailed around the city. And that was also true in many um, cities in the US as well. So that's like a really clear and obvious example. But then there are legacies of that that continue. So even after those um, kind of formal legal regulations are removed and there's also ways in which uh, you know people don't feel comfortable moving in different spaces so this is something we looked at in North Kensington so Kensington and Chelsea is the wealthiest borough in the country um, the southern part of the borough is this kind of playground for kind of super elite global super elite and so this area of North Kensington is sort of increasingly squeezed um, and so and also much more racially diverse than other parts of the borough. Um, and so there are kind of ways in which um, people's, uh, there's more like insidious ways or implicit ways that you might create um, sort of barriers within the streetscape that are to do with making it somewhere uh, pedestrianized or controlling traffic, but they also have these other repercussions that also embed inequality. So some, one example in North Kensington is that there's a, um, a little pedestrianized bit that was built into a street that moves from the very wealthy area to the area by Grenfell Park. And effectively what it does is it screens off the north of the borough from the south. So you get inadvertently or not, this kind of built in division where you are literally built like a crossing the line between the wealthy area and the not so wealthy area. So there's things like that. Um, and then there's also, of course, Got institutional ways in which the process of planning um, can also um, be discriminated on, but it's quite specific, not just racially, but in terms of socioeconomic background and in terms of housing allocation, social housing. So, one of the questions around Grenfell Tower is um, that's been raised through the inquiries. So there's an inquiry, government inquiry going on at the moment into. The causes in the background of the fire and um two of the the qcs who represent bereaved families have said you know we can't this inquiry will not be a just one unless we also look at institutional racism in the processes that led to the fire so the refurbishment of the fire and how residents concerns were dealt with and whether or not um questions of institutional racism come into play and in how they were heard or not listened to. So we'll see if this is going to be taken up, but it's still okay. I have a question of how you manage kind of the scope of the research because it's so it's so interesting. Like how do you pick kind of a, a focus, like how do you narrow it down, how do you choose what's most relevant, than what you feel like you need to look at? Because even as you talk about it, I'm jumping in places mentally going, oh my God, what about like the mentally creative boundaries people have with these like spatial places? Yeah. And I'm wondering how you like choose your kind of path to go down, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is like the kind of fundamental question of ethnography, I guess, yeah. that everything is ethnography. How do we know what it is that we're looking at? And that's something that you know, anyone who's done any field work will tell you that when you start, you're just like, Everything is important. <laughs> what to write? What do I put in my notebook? And sometimes it can be paralyzed because actually you, everything seems interesting and you can't see it. So um, I try not. I mean, obviously, I have things I'm interested in that I, you know, I have chosen to go to particular places. But I try not to be too too closed up and try and keep it open to, and to what I find within reason. Um, but yeah, it's really, really difficult. I suppose I have things that 
cross-cut my work in Kenya and in the UK that I come back to so questions about materiality, about urban design, about legacies from the past. And so that becomes like a hook, I guess, that brings me back round in a, in a circle. Um, but it's really, yeah, it's really, really challenging. And I think it's like the great thing of doing anthropology is that you can go in these different directions. But yeah, it's also why you, some academics, you know, they'll write about the first place they did feel like for their whole careers because they feel like they've never said it enough, which may be a good thing or not. <laughs> Depending on who's reading it. Um, I should say, I guess it's also driven by um, things that come up. So if you get say last week I got invited to contribute to a project that's happening in Nairobi about integrating art practice and academic research. So then I'll do something that I've done various things in the past, but then I'll bring it into focus for that event. So it's not more pragmatic. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, oh no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Was there anything else that you want to talk about from your, or that you think was like particularly interesting from your? Uh, I, don't know. I guess I was going to ask if people have questions about, I don't know how many of you are doing dissertation field work, if you wanted to ask any questions about that or about how. Oh, I could talk about this project. This is quite interesting. This is like a side thing I did for a while about camp, which is completely not what you're asking my <laughs> So this is about uh, being part of um, a really big project. Um, so this project was led by um, BAC, and it's about, uh, increasingly relevant now, but it started in 2014. It's about xenotic diseases. Do you know what xenotic diseases are? Oh, I know. Yeah? <laughs> I think now we're all there, right? COVID, but before COVID, I'm not sure everyone knew it all. So basically, you need diseases that jump the species divide, so they jump from human to animals. And this project is about bovine TB, so that's TB in cattle, uh, and it's in Ethiopia. And it's a veterinary project that uh, was led by the University of Cambridge, and they're basically doing a very, very broad project, but the ultimate goal of trying to develop a vaccine for cattle for bovine TB, which is important for human health. People who work down is obviously important for animal health, but it's important economically because it's about the, the dairy industry and it has all of these kind of uh, knock-on effects in terms of global trade and uh, uh, yeah, obviously also as we're now increasingly aware in terms of future disease as well. So they had a social science team as part of this project um, so I was part of that team and so it was kind of interesting uh, experience of doing ethnography about a science project so I spent a lot of time hanging out with dairy farmers, but also with vets and immunologists and people doing all kinds of different um, scientific endeavours that I had to learn a lot about. Um, and this, uh, these are just a few scenes from Ethiopia. Yeah. Was, was this something that you were interested in, or did you, you put yourself out there? To go and join. <laughs> it's because it's not what I really want. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was basically it came about during, um, after I finished my PhD, I was working at a research institute at UCL, and the head of this research institute um, was the lead of the social science team, and then they needed like additional support, so I got, I, I think I averaged out like one day a week, so it wasn't a full-time job. But it meant that I sort of occasionally stopped work doing all this urban stuff and went to Ethiopia for like a month. Um, but it was really interesting. And actually, um, so I spent part of my childhood on a farm, on a, on a, on, not on a dairy farm, but on a cattle farm. So I actually had some experience about bovine TV from then. So it was kind of an interesting full circle for me. <laughs> the anthropology of food and supply chains. And Is there anything else on the, the slideshow? Oh, background to the cat. What was the cat's name? I you know what, I can't remember. But you can see it's eating this plate of steak. It's cute, is it? Yeah, so did she, I do know, would she lived in a kind of very tiny house and she didn't have a lot of money, but she fed her cat on steak. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was so tiny and the cat was so big. <laughs> <laughs> She was so nice. That's she was fantastic. Nice.
Um, I have one more question. Actually, about permission to transfer. Yeah, it really weirdly reminds me of like five-year plans from like the <laughs> Soviet Union. Yeah, really <laughs> just to kind of phrase around it, and I was wondering if you make that sort of like historical link between like development and like how they plan that sort of thing, and that's something that comes up like quite frequently for you. Yes. So uh, while I was working on this project, a friend of mine who uh, works in local government in the UK said, oh, that's interesting. I've just been working on Bradford's Vision 2022. <laughs> 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 so yeah, there's definitely like a language that comes Yes, yeah, everyone has it. And actually it's completely, so yes, there are all these echoes of long-term planning, um, five-year plans, you know, that kind of big top-down kind of approach but even more specifically in the vision 2030 example is that um there's this big international consultancy called mckinsey I oh, yeah. Heard of them, yeah? so they work a lot on these plans and so mckinsey were drafted in to work on nairobi kenya vision 2030 and then it turned out they'd also worked on mumbai 2030 <laughs> uh, hyderabad 2035 um, so all of these cities and you can look at the document Presentation on that. It's pretty much a copy of my book. So, nice work if you can get it. Um, but yeah, so for sure, there are these echoes going around. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much.